thank you for it. We pray now by your Holy Spirit that you would come, that you would work in us and work through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah. Interesting. Going through Hebrews, uh, looking back uh, at all that we've been looking at these last 11 chapters in chapter 12 this morning, the last major section of this letter, this book, uh, where the writer, after having laid out this extensive, extensive uh, series of arguments, and I don't mean to argue, but series of arguments providing the basis for why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe, why faith is so essential. And I'm not talking about mental assent, just simply believing, but I'm talking about faith that produces an action, why that is so critical to walking with the Lord, why it is that uh, when our lives are pressed in, that there's design to that often. And, and so as we've been looking at this, we're essentially saying, Lord, as you taught these Hebrew believers in the first century who were just under it, and we've talked about that many times, but again, to understand the context of this book, you've got to understand that the people it was written to were having some extreme struggles and trials in their lives. And so as we look at that, we see that there's application to us because we go through things, don't we? We all go through things. And so uh, we're essentially saying, Lord, in the same way that these people were challenged, we're challenged. In the same way that you teach them, teach us. Let us apply these things to our lives because otherwise we're just coming down here and getting a book report and that's not God's design. So as we look at this, we the overall theme in Hebrews, just to, to catch the, the big picture, is the Lord Jesus. And that's it. Yes, in this last, well, this 12th chapter, as we're getting into chapter 12, we'll see that there's a theme to this particular chapter. And simply, it's endurance. The word is mentioned four times throughout the chapter. The, the writer keeps, he'll build a case and talk about, Okay, now this is the answer, is you need to endure. You need to bear up under the circumstances that you're in in the same way that these people in the first century needed to bear up. They needed to hang in. They needed to stick it out. They needed to, in this case, he uses the metaphor of running a race. He's, you need to see it through to the finish line. You've got to go through this to get to that. And, and so that's what we're looking at. And we see all through Hebrews that the writer's purpose is de demonstrating that Jesus is superior. He's better. Uh, he's greater than the Old Testament prophets. We looked at that way back in chapter one. He's greater than uh, the, the Old Testament priesthood. He's greater in his atonement for sin. His offering, his sacrifice is better than the sacrifices that they had under the law. He's greater than anything and anyone that had gone before. The writer in chapter 11 parades a whole list of people out to, to show that these people went through things and yet they went through things for a purpose. They, what he's doing in that is he's saying, these people walked by faith. They believed God. They didn't just believe in him, but they believed him and that produced a life that was lived for him. And as we've looked back, Remember in chapter 11, he goes all the way back to Adam. Well, actually, the, to their sons, to Cain and Abel. And he brings it forward, goes through the patriarchs, goes through the fathers, goes through all of these people. And then remember, there was a shift at, towards the end of chapter 11 where he stops talking about people that did well. And he starts talking about people that really didn't do well. And we talked about that last week, about how very often the circumstances that we find ourselves in don't change. And that that can be for God's glory as well. Uh, the, the, the silliness of the doctrines that are flying around out there that talk about promising that you're going to prosper in some way or that you're going to, uh, you know, if you do this, then God's going to do that as though he's obligating himself are, are just silliness. Uh, there are real answers to real life issues in this letter. And that's where we want to go. That's where uh, I want to go in my own life, in my own walk with the Lord. I want to understand that there is value here. 
So as we've looked at this, we've seen that Jesus fulfilled everything found in the law. All of the priesthood sacrifices, festivals, all of it was fulfilled by him. And we talked last week, I touched on it last week, the two things that the Jews were looking for. Number one, they were looking for Messiah to come. And, and, and in that, they expected that there would be one who would be sent and that he would be the one that would establish the government that, as we're going to look at when we look at Christmas Eve, at, at the, the prophecy in Isaiah about the government would be upon his shoulders, and that in that sense, that, that they thought that Messiah would come, number one, and number two, that he would set up his kingdom then. Messiah did come when Jesus came. Remember what the people's response was when he came into town on that last Sunday and they were throwing the palm fronds on the road and crying out, Hosanna, save now, set up your kingdom now. That was the expectation. And by the end of that week, they would have turned on him. They would be the same people that would be in the crowd screaming, crucify him. Because they didn't understand that he needed to atone for sin. So the people in the first century here, they had looked at and received Jesus as Messiah. They'd turned their back on Judaism and they had embraced Christ. They thought because it was a logical way. And I mean, they're living this out. We read it. We get to see the end from the beginning and all of that. But these people are living it out. And as they're living it out, they're thinking, oh, great. You know, it's just like when, when the guy's mom came and said, hey, can, you know, when you establish your kingdom, can one of my boys be on your right and one on your left? You know, talking about the sons of thunder and all. And, and Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking because they thought that he was going to set up his kingdom then. Even after he rose from the dead, they thought he was going to set up his kingdom. What they got instead was persecution. What they got instead of having an office next to his, because their expectation was that he was going to do it, that he was going to rule and reign from Jerusalem at that time, he ascended into heaven. And, and it, with the promise that he would come back, but he never told them when. Whenever they questioned Jesus, they said, well, tell us, Lord, when are you, what's going to be the sign of your coming? He would go through, and he went through the whole deal. There, there you see in Matthew 24 and all. But he would, his emphasis was always not on when, but on your posture when I do. You be ready. That's always the emphasis, folks. It's always what he's working in us. As we go through these things, well, what happened in the first century? These people had a very solid expectation that he would set up his kingdom, and he didn't. And, and he will. He hasn't yet. It's been 2,000 years. But they were bummed. They were really getting sideways about this whole thing because they were losing jobs. They were losing family. They were losing property. I mean, they had great amount of loss in, in their lives. And, and we sometimes go through things and, and what the writer's doing in chapter 11 is he's saying, look at these people who lived by faith and, and things didn't always go well for them. He's continuing that in chapter 12 here because they were persecuted. They were under the gun. They were ha going through it. So I'm going to read through the first four verses and that's probably all we're going to get through today as we look at it is to run this race. Uh, verse 1, therefore, the, the writer is saying, therefore, because of all that he said before in chapter 11, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So as we look at this, he says, therefore, again, referencing chapter 11, referencing this whole list of people, this cloud of witnesses that he's talking about, uh, the people who by faith had believed him, trusted him in God. Uh, and, and when he talks about this cloud of witnesses, it's not many, there's a, a popular teaching out there, gang, that, that says that it's, it's all of the Old Testament saints that are like looking down on us and they're looking down on our lives. I don't believe that's what's indicated in the text here. 
if I'm in heaven, the last thing I want to be doing is looking at you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but the point is, is <laughs> amen, yeah. But the point is, is that we're not talking about onlookers, we're talking about examples. That's what he's doing. He's giving an illustration. What he's going to talk about is, is an arena. He's going to use a metaphor of an arena with runners. And he's saying that we have this cloud of witnesses, and the, the word witness is marturion. It's where we get the word martyr from, but it's also where we get the word testimony from. So we have this, this group of testimonies, this cloud of witnesses and he's using, in this metaphor, it's like they're in the, in the seats, so they're looking down as we run the race. But it's an example, it's not a revelation. I, I don't <laughs> believe that that's, that's saying that, and, and you hear often, you know, when somebody's passed and all the while they're looking down on it. I, I just, I think that that's a comforting thing to sometimes think about, but I don't believe that that's based in the reality of God's word. What the writer is wanting to do here is say, look at all of these people who've gone before they form this cloud of witnesses that look down. If you picture your life as a race and you're a runner, you're the one who's now on the track and they've already done that. Look at the testimony of their lives. So the point is these witnesses are not witnessing us as we can witnessing to us of faith and endurance in all that they lived and experienced before us. That's the point that the writer's making when he says this great cloud of witnesses. Uh, when he says, let us lay aside the weights, further on in, in, in verse 1, uh, literally he's saying, let us lighten the load and throw off everything that hinders. Folks, you don't have to be in sin to be distracted. You don't have to be sinning to be falling short in your walk with the Lord. There are things in our lives that are not necessarily sin that can get in the way. And, and for each of us, that's going to look different. That's part of why I exhort you on a fairly regular basis. Don't think about what that list is for the person next to you. But truly, there are weights. I have weights in my life that are going to look different than the weights that you have in yours. You know, I have to be really careful that... that, that there are some things that just distract me. Uh, I, I know for me, one of the things that I have to be careful of is how much time I spend on the computer. I spend a great deal of time studying and all of that, and I love being by myself in my, in my study, and yet that can become a weight. It can, become, it can actually start to supplant the time I have with the Lord and the time I have with my wife. And so, again, for me, that's a weight. Maybe that's not for you. But different things can be weights. They're, because we're sort of wired to think in terms of right and wrong. And, and, and that's good. I mean, it's good to discern good from evil, right from wrong. But uh, with the choices that we make, when we're talking about in reference to these weights that the writer's bringing out, uh, around across here, is not something that's necessarily right or wrong, but something that may or may not hinder my walk with the Lord. And, and when he talks about running this race, the word for race is agony. It's the same word. It's the same root. What he's talking about is the struggle to cross the finish line. It's not something that you just get up and say, oh yeah, I ran the race. No, it requires intention. It requires work. It requires effort. And that's why he uses this particular word. The word race, again, it's, a, it's kind of a tricky word to translate from Greek into English, but it's the same word. It, what it means is to agonize. It's a demanding, grueling, agonizing thing that you do, that I do, as we run this race of faith. And that's what he's getting at. He's getting at the fact that it's not necessarily easy, it's not necessarily sinful, but that as we agonize, as we go through these things, as we work this thing out, that there, it requires work. It requires something from me. And, and so the question then becomes, well, what do we do? And the answer he gives here is throw off, set aside, lay down those things that hinder us. And, and, and I can't tell you what hinders you. I can tell you what hinders me. But as we examine our hearts and we hold that up to the Lord, he's faithful to show us the things that are in the way. 
Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's a thing. Sometimes it's a habit. Uh, there are, there's just a whole list of things, and I'm not going to take the time to even go through a lot of examples, but there are things that can compete for our affection for the Lord that are not necessarily sin. That's his point. So the picture here is that the runner would come out and as he's getting ready to go onto the track, you know, and if you look at people, like if you, you're watching a track meet on television or you're attending one, the runners come out, they usually, you know, like they have their sweats and all of that, their outer clothing. They would come out and they would begin to strip off the stuff that would be weights. They would begin to lighten the load to run the race. That's part of why this metaphor works so well and why he's using it. Uh, interesting, I was reading on this, and in Greek culture, a lot of, the writers that talk about this kind of a race in, in Greek, uh, in their society, is that they would take all of their clothes off. And so they actually ran races naked, which would not work in December in Oregon. But <laughs> the point is, is they, they would get rid of the baggy clothing that would slow them down. Uh, anything that hinders our progress as Christians, things that divert our attention, things that take our energy, that uh, I know there have been many times where I've been involved in, in one ministry or another over the years where I realized that things actually becoming a hindrance because not that it doesn't require work and that, that it doesn't require perseverance and all of that, but it's something that the Lord has shown me is that there are times where I am putting my energy into something that's going nowhere. And, and that I, he's shown me that to pull it back and to invest my time and my energy into things that are fruitful and things that he's in. Uh, every ministry, folks, has a, it has a birth, it has a life, and it has a death. Every ministry, every job, every career, uh, we live in a temporal world. The reason why it's called temporal is because it's temporary. And so as we identify things in our lives that are weights, it may be something that we, that the Lord is tapping us to say, you know what, you need to just let go of that because it's getting in the way. And that's something that we can spiritually discern. That's something that I love the, the passage in Proverbs. It says there's safety or there's victory in a multitude of counselors. Uh, because often when we are with trusted friends or, or people, I surround myself with, with men that I trust that I can go to and, and ask things about and, and all, we can identify things that are weights, things that are, that, that are slowing us down. Because we've only got so much time and we've only got so much energy. And so we want to run this race as efficiently as possible. That's the writer's point. When he talks about laying aside the sin that so easily ensnares us or entangles us, depends on the translation you're in. Sorry, Oregon runny nose. Um, if we go in context here, when he talks about setting aside or laying aside the sin, let us, is what he says, there's two let us sayings, let us lay aside the, the weights in the sin and then let us run with endurance. So this first one, he's saying, laying aside the sin. If you go in context, realize that these people were struggling with their faith. He's talking about the sin of unbelief. In context, yeah, sins generally, sure, of course, if you're caught up in an area of sin, if I get caught up in an area of sin, I want to repent of that and I want to have that be done. Of course, but with looking specifically at what the writer is addressing here, remember back in chapter three and four when he talked about Israel, I mentioned it last week, that he said they came out of Egypt by faith, but they refused to go into the promised land. And that was the sin of unbelief. The writer's been addressing that throughout this book. So specifically, what he's talking about here is I believe the sin of, he doesn't say the sin of unbelief, but it, it really is the only specific sin that fits the context of what's being written. So uh, simply, the sin of unbelief is a lack of faith in God, a lack of faith, a lack of trust that God is who he is and that he says what he says and that something is required of me in believing that. Because show me your faith, I'll show you my works. Remember, that's what James says. 
So uh, the, the fact of that is that a lack of faith in the life of a believer, and I'm not talking about saving faith because there is a, a, a saving faith when you're outside of Christ, uh, perhaps part of some other ism, then there is a, an initial faith that brings you into the kingdom of God. When you trust Christ for your sins, when you come and you let the weight of your life down on him and you say, Lord, I believe you did that for me. Yes, absolutely. That is coming from unbelief to belief initially. But also there is the place in a Christian's life where we are all dealing with areas of unbelief. There are areas where God is challenging us, where he's allowing us to come to a place where circumstances in our lives cause us to say, I have to trust you on this. These people were in that place with the persecution and the troubles that they were going through. And we can derive a great application in our lives for the same. Lord, I, I don't know how this is going to come out. I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand how, how these things are going to benefit me or the kingdom or you or anything else. But I have to trust that you're in it and I'm going to walk through it with you. Those are challenges that we all get and they come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? So the point is, is that as these people are dealing with the sin of unbelief, it was keeping them from moving forward. They were actually thinking about moving backward, going back to Judaism. And he's saying, that's a bad idea. It doesn't exist anymore. It's actually been replaced. So it's why the writer says, not run, but let us run because we're all in this together. Uh, when he says, let us run, if you look at it in the first couple of verses, he says, we and us. In, in verses three and four, he says, you, and we'll get to that. Um, but he's marked out the course for each of us. Each of us has a different course, but we have, essentially, we have our own lane on the track. Uh, if you've looked at how runners line up when they're getting ready to run a race, they each have their own lane. My lane doesn't necessarily look like yours, but we're both in this race. He's saying, don't give up, stay the course. There's a finish line ahead. Verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Actually, the entire letter to the Hebrews is an exhortation to and, and for us that we forever fix our eyes, look unto Jesus. Uh, if we do so, it'll enable us to see things with a perspective that actually fits our lives. When we start, as I'll tell you what, when I, when I try to just take things apart and look at them through the lens of this world, very often, number one, they don't make sense. Number two, it's upsetting. <laughs> I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna go all political on you this morning, I promise. I was watching the, the stuff on television last week uh, okay, I'll get a little political. Um, the, the whole impeachment deal, and, and I'm, not, I'm not weighing in on that. I'm just saying that if I look at that just through the eyes of my flesh, and I look at that just through a temporal lens, I go, oh my goodness, what a charade. And yet if I look at that and I understand that the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord, it's like a stream of water and he directs it where he chooses as soon as I overlay that onto this, I have peace. It makes sense. I'm not worried about it. I'm not staying up at night wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. Because there's a certain peace that comes because I trust Christ. Because I trust God. Because I have faith that this life is bigger than what I see. And the writers made sure to bring us to that point over and over again. He's saying, look at the physical realm, now look at the spiritual Look at this with the eyes of your flesh or look at it with the eyes of the Holy Spirit through the eyes of the, that, that God gives you, the spiritual vision, and life actually begins to make more sense. So that's what he's getting at when he's talking about fixing your eyes on Jesus. Um, and, and let's face it, folks, we mostly live our lives with our eyes on temporal things. Uh, I know very often the Lord reminds me 
to, I, I shared with you guys before about my kids when they would fight and they'd have an argument and get all scrappy with each other. Uh, and I would say, hey, take it to high ground, guys. And, and what that meant was stop doing this in the physical plane. Understand that there's a spiritual application of what you're doing. And my kids would go, oh, okay. And sometimes they'd keep fighting. <laughs> you know how kids are. But sometimes, and as they got older, they understood that there's value in, in switching gears and, and elevating their focus from that thing that they're upset about to what's God's heart in this. And that was always the exhortation, seek his heart in these things, and it'll make more sense. You'll, you won't be prone to be scrapping with each other. And it's the same thing for us as grown-ups. We won't be prone to be knocked off our pins if we're walking by faith, if we're walking with an understanding that God has this. Whether it's the circumstances in my life or it's the government or whatever it is, he has it. And there's just a peace that comes. When he says looking unto Jesus, literally that word looking means to fix your gaze. It means uh, the, a literal translation of that word is to look away from all else to fix one's gaze upon, to keep thinking about without having one's attention distracted. It's a very strong word. What he's, when he says looking at or fixing our eyes on Jesus, how it's translated in other translations, it, it, it's an intentional thing. It's, it's, I'm so focused on the Lord that I'm not mindful of other things in that moment. I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm fixing my eyes on him in the midst of this trial in the midst of this challenge, in the midst of this difficulty, in the midst of this thing I don't understand, as I look to him, as I fix my eyes on him, as I fix my gaze on him, it, it's, it's like that, the old hymn, fix our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his grace. That's where that comes from. It comes from this verse. Because as I do that, my priorities get aligned with his. My heart gets aligned with his. My thoughts become his thoughts reflected in me. My understanding becomes spiritual, not just temporal, not just carnal. And there's a whole transformation that comes about. I'm looking at the exact same circumstances. I'm looking at the same trouble. I'm looking at the same thing. And yet there's a whole different thing that comes about in me as I fix my eyes on Jesus. That's the point. Interesting, as he talks about this, is he's looking, he says that, he, that he's the author and finisher of our faith. If you'll notice, the word hour is in italics. That means it was added by translators. And there are times where I think that's a good thing. But I also think that there are times where it creates a bit of a hindrance to our understanding. And I think this is one of those. It's a mild one, but it's still there. Literally what he's saying is fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Do you really believe him? Do you trust him with your life? Do you believe that he's bigger than any circumstances that you can face? Do you believe that He has your life in the palm of his hand, even if you see circumstances you don't see are going to get better. That's what it is to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. It means that he's the originator. He's the pioneer of faith. And and that as we do that, faith takes on a depth that we don't get if we're just taking, as I mentioned before, sort of this mental ascent, uh, this shallow view of what it is to truly believe. Because the belief that he's talking about here is a belief that goes to the heart. It goes to the core. And it shapes our thinking. It shapes our lives. Because I truly believe this stuff. It's not just Sunday stuff. This is the way that I want to live my life. This is letting the weight, uh, you hear me say that, letting the weight of my life down on him. How do I do that? By faith. I trust that he is, and he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him, is what the Bible tells us. So when Jesus came into the world, he lived his life always, always focused on the Father. He lived a life that he said, I don't do anything 
of my own initiative, only that which the Father gives me to do. Why? He lived a life of perfect faith in the work of the Father. He lived the way that we're being exhorted to live here. Yes, he was God. We think, well, he was God. He could do that. No, he was also fully man and fully subject to the same things that can tend to derail us. The, the Bible says he was tempted in all ways, even as we are, and yet without sin, without wandering, without straying from having his focus fully on the Father. So when he talks about the joy that was set before him, as we're working through this, what is the joy that was set before him? Simply, you, me. Jesus knew that the cross was looming throughout his life, especially in his, during his earthly ministry. He knew that that was what he was born for. He knew he was going to also knew he was going to resurrect from the dead. He knew he was going to accomplish redemption for any who would, by faith, come to him. It says that for the joy that was set before him. He, dis- he endured the cross and despised the shame. I, I think about joy uh, and-, and share with you folks before, and yet it's just important we understand what joy is. It's not happy. Jesus wasn't happy going to the cross. We see in the garden where he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood because the stress was so great as he faced what was coming. But he, what it, because of the joy that he had, because of the joy that was before him, he was able to look beyond the cross, beyond the, the torment and the torture and the pain, and to see what it was that he was accomplishing. And what he was accomplishing was the ability to bring his church, his bride, and present her without spot before the Father. And if you belong to him this morning, that's... That was the joy that was set before him. He knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was the only one in all of human history that had the qualifications to pull it off. Because he loves you. He loves me. With a love, I, I, man, I admit, I don't understand his love. I'll take it, but I don't understand it. I don't understand the depth of his love. It's a love that is, is... beyond my comprehension, and yet it's an eternal love, and I want that love. I want his love shed abroad in my heart, as the word tells me. I, I, I want to be able to deal with others in that way. And so it says, for the joy that was set before him, joy is, is something that the Holy Spirit communicates to our soul, to our, your soul is who you are, it's your you, all right? Happiness is communicated to your soul, to me by my circumstances. And so there are times where I'm unhappy or there are times that I'm exceedingly happy and everything in between. Joy, though, is much deeper. It's something that the Holy Spirit communicates to my soul that communicates, he communicates to me on a level that it's just this this certainty in my soul that it's all going to work out. It's all going to be okay. It's all going to be in place. And yet, it's not affected by my circumstances. I, I, I've shared, when, I, when my mother passed away, when she went to heaven back, this is 25, 28 years ago, I, I remember the first time I experienced true joy when I was eulogizing my own mother as she had died. And I was intensely sad inside. I was mourning, I was grieving. And yet because she had transacted with God and she had come to an understanding of the the power of the cross in her life and understood that she was part of that joy that was set before him, I had great joy knowing that she had just essentially graduated. And, and, And there's a great joy that comes in the middle of tough circumstances, guys, We go through things and we go through things if we don't understand what joy is. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. I actually can be strengthened by walking in the fruit of his spirit, which is joy, in the middle of tough stuff. 
That's how the writer is getting it when he's talking about these people that walked by faith and didn't inherit the promises. That doesn't mean that you have to walk around with a downtrodden face and be all all the time. You may have trials in your life that aren't going to be resolved this side of heaven. And yet there is a certainty, there's a joy that comes from walking with the Lord, from walking by his spirit as he works in us that can't be communicated by our circumstances. It's far deeper. It's something that he communicates to us because it's a part of our birthright as Christians. He knew that he wouldn't be in the grave forever. He knew he was going to be raised from the dead. He knew he was going to be exalted to heaven. He knew he would have a place of power and authority at the right hand of the father. That's what the right hand means in that culture. When there was a king on a throne, the one that sat at his right hand was like, he was like the commander. He was the one who had the power and the authority to carry out the king's edicts and to carry out the king's wishes. Um, He knew that all of that was in place when he faced the cross. So for the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame. He suffered the shame of the cross. And and all that that entailed, I mean, beating, whipping, scourging, being spit upon, punched in the head, Uh, stripped naked, paraded around. I mean, you think about the things that he endured. Um, He suffered the crucifixion itself. Uh, He suffered the rejection of his own father while he was on the cross. He suffered when he took the wrath of God for my sin and yours. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And when he had made a purification for sin, sat down. The work is finished. Remember, we talked about that when we looked at the the Levitical priesthood and all of the stuff that the priests would do when they were doing the, the, the covering for sin with the animal sacrifices and all. There were no chairs in the temple. There were no seats in the tabernacle. But there is in heaven. There is where Jesus dwells because the work is finished. And he endured that to get to this. Make sense? Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So he's not talking about, remember, we're talking about, he's got this picture of an arena and we're running this race. We each have our our lane and we're running and this cloud of witnesses is... again, metaphorically looking upon us and witnessing to us of the the, the successes you can have, even if you have a hard race. And so when he's talking about that, he says, don't become weary and discouraged in your souls because he's not talking about a physical weariness that a literal race would produce. He's talking about a spiritual weariness, a weariness of soul. And, and I know in my own life, I, I, I went through a period of time where I, I had a very weary soul and, and, and my soul became lean. My heart began to drift from the Lord and, and he aligned circumstances. We'll talk about it next week when we talk about chastisement to where he drew me close once more and, and I was able to, to get past that. And so when he's talking about don't become weary and discouraged in your souls because of these circumstances, there is resolution for them. And his name is Jesus, and he wants to give you his Holy Spirit to see you through as you run this race. When he says to consider, that's a, again, it's another strong word. It means to reckon. It means to weigh. It means take some time with. It means to analyze. The, the Greek word is the word analyze. It It means to take time and reason through with thoroughness, completeness. So when he says to consider Jesus, saying just give it flippant consideration that you think about him now and then, what he's saying is to these people and what he says to us is, look at this. Consider all that he's done. Spend some time understanding what he's accomplished on your behalf. Spend some time understanding the depth of his love that's revealed towards you. Analyze this. Look at the cost. Look at what it cost him. Now compare that to what it's costing you. 
Not much. Yeah, it, it's heavy. And, and yet, that's why the Apostle Paul could say, you know, I go through it, and, and, and he could say it. He went through a lot. I mean, you look at a composite of the things that he went through, you know, shipwreck, beaten, left for dead, and imprisoned, and, and snake bitten. I mean, the whole deal. And he could come out of the other side of that and say, it was a momentary light affliction. And I think about that, I think, oh my goodness, Lord, give me that kind of heart because that doesn't look momentary and it doesn't look light. And yet he's looking through the lens of faith. He's looking through the lens of truly trusting that this is God's will for my life. And he knew it and he rested in it. So the writer's saying, consider, analyze, consider Jesus. Don't become weary in your soul. Look at how much he endured. Look at the hostility that was against him. You think you have it tough, first century Hebrew believer with people turning on you, the government turning on you, the religious community turning on you, your family turning on you. These people, they had it tough. It's such great assurance for us because sometimes we have it tough. And if you don't have it tough, put it in your spiritual account and draw it out when it is tough because it does get tough. The things that Jesus endured, look, his life was under a magnifying glass. From the time he showed up there at the Jordan River to get baptized by John the Baptist and the religious leaders were over there murmuring on the side. I mean, they show up at the very beginning. Uh, they, they were always trying to trip him up. They sent spies to, to check him out. They sent officers to arrest him. They examined every word and, and were trying to find something against him. They didn't want to hear the truth. And so they spent their lives at that point doing anything that they could to shut him up. Hostility from sinners. They, they paid Judas to betray him. They, when he was arrested, they staged six mock trials before they put him on the cross. And uh, they showed contempt for him in a way that we won't experience. Uh, Pilate paraded him around. The people shouted, crucify. Essentially, the writer wants them and us to consider that there is one who has endured the harshest treatment. If we look at this with the, the modern day Olympians, I, I was thinking about this, and, and they would endure long, difficult, painful training in, in that sense. In order to get the medal, they would be pressing towards the prize. Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter three. He says, I haven't attained it. I haven't laid hold of that for which I was laid hold of Christ for, but this one thing I do, I press on toward the goal of the high calling in Christ Jesus, that I may lay hold of the prize. And he uses, there are many places in the New Testament where he uses this, this metaphor of running a race to lay hold of that for which we were laid hold of for. The thing I also think about is these guys, we look at this life as a vapor, and sometimes it, I freely confess it doesn't feel like a vapor. It feels long and arduous and hard. And yet, again, using the, the, the metaphor of, of a foot race, these guys, if you looked at the Olympians, I mean, you, I love watching those guys run. I mean, it's like there's one leg here, and then the other leg here, and it's like a straight line when they're jumping hurdles and all that. I mean, they're amazing to watch these athletes run. They train for years. And how long does that race take? A couple minutes? Sometimes less than that? But the point is, is that they've got their eyes on the prize. And that's the writer's point here with using this illustration like I said, it's an illustration, not a revelation. He's not talking about all these people in heaven looking at us. God forbid <laughs> in my life. But the point that he's making here is that these people would spend their life training. And, and, and that's why Paul says, I buffet my body. I, I loosely translate, I buffet my body, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> we can do that after church. But the point is, is that at the end of that race, there would be tears of joy, wouldn't there? 
There would also be tears of sorrow, tears of anguish that I didn't make it. And that's where we guard our hearts. Essentially, using this illustration, he's saying the Christian race, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon that we hang in. And the risk that these people were running in the first century is their heart was really no longer in the race, or maybe it hadn't been. And he wants them to see that there's value in being engaged in this race called faith. He's still talking about faith, by the way. He's still talking about the sin of unbelief, and he's talking about faith. He's talking about what that looks like. So in this life, we know that we'll experience at times great sorrow, suffering, anguish, hopelessness at times, things look hopeless, sickness, and death. And yet, what do we do when life overwhelms? What do we do when tragedy strikes? I, I got a call yesterday and uh, a church where I was at, and Stacy and I were at in California. Uh, this dear friend, uh, uh, her husband had fallen getting out of bed on Wednesday night, and she took him down to the emergency room and they thought that they had fixed him up and they released him and he was still in a lot of pain and, and he got home and collapsed and died. And it's just tragic. And just dealing, talking with this friend yesterday, just absolutely heartbroken. Heartbroken. Things are going along one day and the next day her life is completely changed. And, and, and without her, her soulmate and, and all and uh, my heart just bled for her as she just wept on the phone. And what do we do when those kind of things take place? What do we do when unforeseen circumstances arise? What do we do when things are actually going well? We fix our eyes on Jesus. This isn't rocket science, folks. We fix our gaze. We, we intentionally focus on the spiritual realm and on who it is that we have to do because this life will overwhelm. And yet, I was also thinking about, you know, why do we do communion services? Why did Jesus institute that? That we do that every month here and, and other churches do it different ways at different times. But why did he implement that? Because he knew how important it would be for his people to continually come back around to fix our eyes on him, to fix our gaze upon him, to look at him, to understand life through the lens of faith, to understand life through the lens of Christianity because it doesn't make any sense any other way. And he knew our frailties. He knew our, 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 our ability to just drift. And, and so he said, do this in, often and do it in remembrance of me. Do it in such a way as it shapes your life to where you focus on me in that periodic thing, whenever you do it. That's why we have the Lord's That's why we take that seriously. It's not a ritual. It's not something we do just because that's what we do on the first Sunday of the month. It's something that we do intentionally. And, I, and my prayer is for, for each of us that we do that with the intention of saying, Lord, let me refocus. Lord, let me, let me push the stuff of my life aside and, and, and refocus on you and to understand that you're the only one that's going to make sense of this stuff. Uh, my friend Tammy, that, that's her name in, in, in Northern California, that, whose husband has just gone, and, and he's gone to be with the Lord, and, and yet she's, she's trying to make sense of things, and yet... I also knew when I was talking to her because she's active and she goes to a Calvary Chapel down there in I think Susanville. Um, and, but she's, she's active in a church and she's active. She walks with the Lord. And, and it's like, I, I, I was weeping. We weep with those that weep. We mourn with those that mourn. I, I wasn't going to haul out scriptures for her at that time. I just wanted to be with her, share her grief. And yet I know she's going to be okay. 
She knows where her husband is gone. And it just plain hurts right now. And yet she's already seeking the Lord. She's already had a meeting with her pastor. She's already surrounded herself with other people that are part of that community. And I know that she'll be okay because I know that she's fixing her eyes on Jesus. That's the point. That's what we do when life overwhelms. That's what we do when we don't have the answers. Because guess what? That happens more often than most of us would like to have it happen. I I know some of your stories. I know some of the people in this room. Hard, hard things. And yet, he's bigger than all of that. And he brings us to these constant reminders that he has our lives in his hand. Verse 4. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Their persecution to that point had, wasn't as extreme as the examples that the writer gave in, in chapter 11. Uh, they shortly would, by the way. The persecution, the major persecution, this was written in the early 60s after the Lord had been gone. He'd resurrected and, and, and ascended into heaven. It's about 30 years out from the, the resurrection and all of that. And it's, it's just prior to when a major persecution in the Roman Empire would break out and they would be shedding blood. But the writer here, he's giving kind of a mild rebuke to these people. He's saying, you know, you're not dead yet. He's saying, you know, there's, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. And, and so understand that, yeah, it's tough. And yet, have some perspective. As we go through, I'm going to stop there as far as the text goes, but I want to look at five things as we wrap up that we can learn from Hebrews 12 as we face circumstances in our lives, as we face trials, as we face uncertainty in this life. The first is by remembering, what can we learn here? The first is to, to, we can learn by remembering that we're not alone in the struggle. There's a cloud of witnesses that he talks about. We look back at people who have gone before us. The context is referring to the people in chapter 11 there. But there's such encouragement when I'm talking with someone and I'm going through something uh, there's such encouragement that comes from somebody who has shared a similar trial. Uh, it, it's just a, a, a real comfort that comes. I, I remember when my daughter went to heaven, uh, I was so comforted by people that understood my grief, that understood, that got what I was going through. And, and you know, folks, there was one time, I'll, I'll share this, just because it was such a turning point for me in understanding God's heart. Uh, there was a woman that came to me and, and she said, I, I'm sorry for your loss. And, and, and then she, she went on to say, she said, well, I've never had a child, but I had this dog. And I immediately, and I'm just going to be transparent with you, I immediately flashed anger. I said, what do you mean you had this dog? My daughter died, you know, kind of a thing. But the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke to my heart and he brought me to what we're talking about here. He said, John, John, She's reaching. She's, she's going to the only place where she can draw compassion towards you because she hasn't had a child. But that dog is everything to her. She's trying to find a place to identify with your pain. And, and, and in that moment, I was able to just look at her and say, God bless you, thank you. And, and God touched my heart because it's something that, again, if I look at it through earthly an earthly lens or through the lens of my flesh i'd be going what do you mean that's kind of ridiculous but then if i look at it through the lens of the holy spirit and him saying look she's doing something precious for you in this moment receive it oh, thank you for the reminder lord that's the kind of stuff we're talking about so remembering that we're not alone in the struggle Maybe there's marital conflict. Maybe there's business problems, financial issues. Perhaps it's the loss of a loved one. People that are witnesses to the same. 
that can come and, and help to bear. We bear one another's burdens. And, and I find no greater way to bear another's burden than if it's a burden that I've had in the past and I've seen God's faithfulness in it and I can simply encourage. Having experienced the death of someone close to me, and, and many of us have, if not, we will, um, with Tammy yesterday, I, I was able to just bear her burden for a little while and, and to just let her know how much Stacy and I love her and, and all of that. There's just great comfort that comes from knowing that we're not alone in the struggle, whatever it is. Second thing, we must learn to let go of the weight. Remember, it's not a physical weight, but there are things that kind of cling to us. They're not necessarily outright sins. There's a guy in the Bible named Demas. In, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 23, we read this, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Okay, uh, Paul is he's writing this deal. And then in 2 Timothy, there's something very telling. In 2 Timothy 4, 9, and 10, he says, make every effort, he's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas had been running well. When Paul says that he loved this present world, yeah, there's a point where you say, well, that's sin, but you could also say, well, he was pretty much just, he got distracted, he got caught up in, this life to where it took his focus off of that. And so that for him became a weight and it was a weight that ended up selling him. I mean, he's not listed in a good light here after he had been running well. He was in the company of Mark and the apostle Paul and all of that and he left because he loved this present world. Letting go of the weight, important. The third is to stay on our own track. From verse one, he, when he says, run with the endurance, the race that's set before us, each of us has our own race. You be faithful to God in what you have. You serve the Lord in the way that he's calling you to serve. Looking at another's track is not a good idea. It can frustrate us. It can lead us to envy. Oh, well, I wish I had their track. I wish that it was, my life was as easy as theirs. That's, that's a slippery slope, folks. It's really important that we identify that our life is the life that God has given us. And as we do that, to stay on our track and to be faithful in the lane that he's called us to be in. Very important. Good wisdom from this passage here in Hebrews. In John chapter 21, uh, Jesus is dealing with Peter and he's telling Peter what's going to happen to him when he gets older. He says, you know, somebody's going to come, Peter, and gird you about and take you where you don't want to go. You know, what, well, you know what Peter's response was? He looks at John and he says, well, what about him? <laughs> and I love Jesus' response to Peter. <laughs> he says, um, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. He's saying, Peter, you got your lane. John's got his lane. Stay in your lane. You do what I'm calling you to do. And what that would mean was that Peter would die for his testimony of Christ. John would live, but he had a whole different plan for John. John lived in exile on the Isle of Patmos and was given... The apocalypse, the revelation. I mean, he lived a long time. He's the only one of the apostles that died a natural death. If you look at church history, you look at like Fox's Book of Martyrs, all the rest died violent deaths for their testimony of Christ. Jesus had a plan. The point is, is that he said, Peter, and I mean, just using the same terminology as we're using here, he said, Peter, you stick in your lane. You stay running the race that you've got. I've given you this one, and I've given John that one. Don't worry about what I'm doing with him. You follow me. Good advice. Stay in our lane. The fourth is we do it by focusing on Jesus. He's the heart of it all. 
we don't get caught up and don't get distracted by focusing on other things. The things, the things of earth should grow strangely dim as we fix our eyes on him. We focus on him. He writes the book that's called My Life. And then he completes the work. Excuse me. So he showed us what genuine faithful living looks like. We do well to follow his example. There are lots of things that compete for my affections, for my heart. Some are good, some are not. That's why he says fix your gaze on him. Intently analyze what he is about. That's why we come here. That's why our emphasis here is on teaching God's word verse by verse, book by book through the Bible because we can get the full counsel of God. You won't get it on one Sunday, but you'll get the full counsel of God as you go by realizing that the emphasis is focusing on Jesus. When it talked about him despising the shame, he treated the embarrassment and the shame of the cross as if it didn't matter. It mattered, but he treated it as though it didn't because he had his eyes beyond that. We do well to have that attitude in trials and it's not always easy. It's not always what we automatically default to. But to say, Lord, there's something on the other side of this. There's something more. There's something you want to teach me. There's something that you want to bring into my life, you want to conform me to the image of your son, all of that comes about by focusing on him and not on just the trial or on just the difficulty. We're all growing. There's value in saying, you know, I understand and it matters to me because this is painful, but in the big picture, it doesn't matter. I want to focus on what you're doing and what you're accomplishing. Then I have a heavenly perspective. Then I have a perspective that my trials look they, they make sense. The, the last here as we wrap up from verses three and four, they face these trials by shunning self-pity. Understand something. He says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted a bloodshed striving against sin. As I mentioned, there's a general rebuke here. He says, you're not dying Self-pity is sometimes warranted. Sometimes we do face really tough circumstances. Sometimes we see why it's there. The truth here in this is self-pity is never helpful. We all dip our toe into self-pity at times, don't we? We all go through things and sometimes you go, man, this is just so hard. (laughs) I think it's also worth noting, um, like dealing with my friend yesterday, real grief. It's not the same as self-pity. Prolonged grief can lead to self-pity, and that's unhealthy. But real grief, is there's a distinction that needs to be made there. So to repeat quickly as we wrap up, we remember that we're not alone in the struggle. We let go of the extra weight. We stay on our own track. We stay in our own lane. We focus on Jesus and we shun self-pity. When that wells up, we do well to look beyond that to see that there's a purpose in all of it. It has been and still is persistent trust in the Lord that brings his approval. Now, uh, as we close here, I just want to give you a little preview for next week. In chapter 11, verse 2, it says, for by it, talking about faith, the men of old gained approval. In chapter 11, verse 39, at the end of that chapter, Uh, He says, and all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. He's talking about approval. Next week, we're going to look at what God does when he does not approve of something in our lives. We're going to talk about discipline. We're going to talk about chastisement. We're going to talk about what happens when we go to the woodshed with dad. (laughs) Not fun, but fruitful, productive in our lives. Even that is a good thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Oh, God, there's just so much I want to say here, and we're out of time. And <laughs> just thank you, Lord, for this brief look at, at, at this cloud of witnesses and looking on as we...